sun doesn't shine. This is not just a field of weeds. Thirty years ago, a proud and unique community stood here and beyond. There were houses with picket fences, gardens, young and old people, and the laughter of children. Below the surface of this twisting grass and the beautiful swaying weeping willow tree are the boards and bricks of the remains of 2,500 homes, the largest urban redevelopment in the history of the United States happened right here. 10,000 people were removed from their homes to make room for others. Only parts of a few lonely streets are left in this sea of weeds. A piece of one of the main streets called Eastwick Avenue is also still here with its trolley tracks in place, leading nowhere except to another open field. At one time, Eastwick Avenue was alive and busy with people, businesses, and entertainment. Old number 37 used to come shaking all the way down Island Road onto Eastwick Avenue, where the drugstore and the barbershop were, with dozens of other stores. And this wasn't even the busiest part. 84th and Eastwick was the place to be. But now all is quiet on Eastwick Avenue, except for the sound of the bugs and the airplanes that pass above. The vines stand on both sides of the street where houses and flowers used to be. So close that we're one And oh, what a welcome We'll have for the sun My love for you is to see My name is Mary, my maiden name, Martin, Mary Martin. And I'm at home, this is Eastwick Avenue. I was born down the street here in 1928 and has many memories for me. My name is Reuben Ash. I was born out here in 1925 and this is also my home. We had one trolley, 37. Came from City Hall and went all the way into Chester. We didn't have a, a get off point to get to school. So we used to take the 37 trolley up to Elmwood Avenue catch a 36 and go up to Bartram. On 84th and Eastwick Avenue, we had a dance hall. And every weekend, the band would come out in the street and play, and everybody from Ellenwood danced in the street. We had our own shops, like biracial people, you know, like we had Jewish stores, and everybody. It was just a knitted in community. Chinese we had like hoagies, Chinese restaurants, Chinese laundry, had cleaners, a shoe, shoe repair. We had a lot of haberdashery stores, whatever. About 1958, the redevelopment came in, and they really started to uh, mess the area up. And I think there's about 10,000 uh, acres involved down here. They decided they were going to come down here and, and, and rebuild this whole area. Uh, at the time, it was a big problem, of course, because everybody down here got excited. It was at town meetings. They had meetings over at the school to find out what what the thing was at the time. Uh, and I guess the biggest thing at, at that time, there was a lot of animosity between the developers and the people down here because they treated the people as a, as a commodity, I think, rather than anything else. Uh, they took the people, they put them into a, a situation where they had no recourse except to get out of their homes and move. Uh, in most, in almost all cases, and of course, people lived down here for a long time and, and just refused to do that. Uh, you, you almost have to understand the neighborhood, I guess, to a certain degree. We had a neighborhood that was basically a mixed neighborhood. Uh, we had black, white, uh, Chinese, Spanish. We had all kinds of people down here that lived together with no problems whatsoever on, on race, religion, or creed. And uh, I guess at the time, it was the only really integrated neighborhood in the city of Philadelphia. Oh, in approximately 1964, 65, uh, the redevelopment and the Board of Education decided that they wanted more homes. And we, were, we went to a meeting over at the uh, Wolf School, and uh, it was Halloween time, and we still had our houses around here for the kids to, a few of the houses for the kids to have fun on Halloween. 
But when that man finished talking to us, he was going to condemn everything. And he told that we owe somebody when they won. But he go over what they went to see what they all about. He told us they weren't taking no more rent off us anymore. I said, why? He said, you got to move. I said, got to move? I said, where I'm going? I, don't got I, I, I said, I don't know where, where I can move the right away. He said, well, we won't. He said, now, we don't, we don't want the house. Said, we want the land. He said, for you, for, for, I was going to say, you can take the house with you. I said, I don't want no house either. What am I going to do with a house, a brick house? And so uh, I, I, I didn't pay it much mind because I didn't believe we had to move out of it. I'd been out there so long. I didn't believe we had to move. And so later on, I came to work that night, that morning, about 9 o'clock. Here come a big guy uh, ringing my bell and told me he could find a place yet. I said, no, I haven't found no place yet. I said, I, said, I don't know. Where, where can I find a place at? He said, well, if you don't move by such, such a time, I forgot now what time he gave me. He said, we'll move you. I said, move me where? Down 30th Street. I said, uh-uh, my kids ain't going down on 30th Street. I said, you wouldn't, let, you wouldn't let your kids go down there, would you? The redevelopment came in, and they, they had this right of eminent domain by, uh, that they went on, they called it. Uh, they had to go to Congress to get permission to uh, redevelop this area. And for some reason, Congress, of course, gave it to them. I think the cities, at the time, that this, one of the stated things was that they were going to be able to expand the tax base for the city of Philadelphia by putting 10,000 homes down here. The redevelopment at that time had the power to go down to City Hall, go into the records, take your name off the deed completely, and put their own name on that deed. Uh, and that's what they did in this house. Now, at the time, my father had been offered, uh, I think it was either fifteen dollars or $20,000 for this property uh, by an individual buyer. The redevelopment, when they came in, they offered him $9,000 for it. The only recourse my father had to do at that time was to go to Arbor arbitration court to negotiate the price because the sale was final. The, the redevelopment did just take your name off the books. Uh, and they did that with five homes on this block. And of course they did that with everybody else in the neighborhood. Now with many of the people in the neighborhood, they, some sold because they were offered, they were the first one on the block who sold and they were offered a, a higher price for the house than the house was worth. Uh, Namoli's, for example, down here, I believe that they uh, received a pretty good uh, price for their row home. The redevelopment then moved them out and they left the house go bad. They left the doors, the kids broke the windows, they broke the doors, rats got in there, the water was broken inside, the cellar flooded, and the house next door, of course, started to go into shambles also. Those people had to sell. They sold at a slightly lower price than, than the first house. The redevelopment then let, would let that house go. Uh, and, and by the time you got down to the end of the block, the people at the end of the block were taking less money for their houses than the houses were worth because of, of uh, the, the state of the rest of the block. It, they couldn't sell it to anybody else but the redevelopment. And then the redevelopment would come and say, well, look, your, your block is a mess and, and we're not going to pay any more than this much money for it. Um, so eventually they would, they would take everybody on the block. There were some people who resisted. Uh, I know that the... I, I can't go back my memory and pull out any names, but I know that there were people who, uh, there was an incident where a sheriff, a sheriff attempting to move a, a lady out of one house did shoot her in the hand. Uh, I know that they had to use force, physical force, to move some of the people out of the neighborhood. Uh, and today there's, there's still some people who just refuse to move altogether. Now the reader alone hasn't taken their property because it's, uh, even though it's condemned, because it's, they don't, they're not building, I guess, right now, so they don't have to worry about knocking the house right down at this point in time. Are you satisfied with the purchase price? No. Because we put already $3,000 in that house. You mean in addition to the 7800 you paid, you put $3,000 in repairs? That's right. I mean remodeling and everything. This is my mother. She has five kids and she's a widow. Okay. Will she be... Talk to them and try to get them to raise it. All right. Where well, should I go down? What would you take for it? I'd pay for one, and if they would give it to me right away, because they'd hurt my income over. 
Are these people to suffer in the end, in your opinion? Not a bit. They'll get the fair value of their property. They'll have an opportunity to buy or rent a house, which in most instances will be better than what they have now. And if they don't like it, they'll have uh, a very fair return in which they can move and go somewhere else. That's too bad, but every time the government exercises the right of eminent domain, uh, somebody is replaced who doesn't like it. Delaware Expressway, Schuylkill Expressway, all of our problems, all of our improvements raise that same problem. Of course, the physical and emotional toll on my parents was extreme. My mother had, I'm sure, uh, a tremendous amount of sickness and ill health because of, of stress-related problems in dealing with the Redevelopment Authority. To, to be uprooted out of your family home is, I, I don't think, is an is a, uh, insignificant fact. The redevelopment was still only going to pay us $9,000 in 1980 for a house that, uh, that they estimated that that's what it was worth in 1958, when the actual market price was 15058 uh, And I'm sure that this house in a, in a rate, you know, in 1980 was worth two, three times that much money. Uh, and they weren't going to pay my parents for any uh, improvements that they put on a house. If they put a new roof on a house, if they, if they put new wallpaper in a, in, a, in a house, if they painted it, all of that money went down to twos when the redevelopment took the, took the, uh, the property. Uh, well, basically what happened, of course, I guess there were changes in the redevelopment part, the authority. People left, um, and, and my parents were still holding on. They refused to move. There was only one of the families on this block decided that they were going to move. I, th I think they had, they, they had some problems in the family, and and they decided they were going to move, and they sold to the redevelopment. They were a twin, basically, a twin home down a block. And uh, the redevelopment let that house catch on fire, begin to go abandoned, catch on fire. And the next door neighbor's house, who was not condemned, they had to sell to the redevelopment authority because of uh, the house being next door, being infested by rats and, and uh, you know, water bugs and, and lice and things of that nature that lived in there. Uh, so they had to sell. The redevelopment finally came and knocked those two homes down, and the land that was on, those two homes had today, the redevelopment now is giving it at a nominal fee to the next door neighbors to increase their yardage, <laughs> which is crazy because they condemned the houses in the first place to take the land. They condemned our house, of course, because we have a big side lot. And they and he came down. We said, we're not going to let you have that much land. They said, you know, that land's going to become valuable in the future, and, and we're not going to let you take it. Uh, you got too much land, we're going to take some of it off you. That's basically what they said they were going to do. They said, we're going to condemn your house, you sign the papers, we'll give you the house back, uh, but we're taking all your land. That would be the story one year. The next year they were going to take the house and, and take that down. So it was always a matter of, of changing stories. And as I say, it really affected my parents' health. Uh, to prove that would be difficult. And it's useless today anyway, because in order to finally get the deed to the house back, we had to sign a paper that we would not go to court and we would not press charges or seek any type of restitution from the Redevelopment Authority. You want to remember at all times that when the councilmen are here, whether you like them, dislike them, have a favor for their election or a disfavor, you treat them the same as you would like to be treated yourself. In this respect, we are not a mob. We are a well-organized group. It was evident that uh, the redevelopment was going to actually take over the properties. And uh, I thought it was more or less suitable for us to move. We've enjoyed living where we did all the time we were there. And if we felt, if we could, uh, move into a nicer neighborhood, we were going to do so. And as it was, we received our notice from the real estate negotiation. And we went <coughs> down there, we negotiated. They offered us a price of 8200 which we rejected. Two weeks later, we received a letter from the real estate appraisers that they have increased our price to $9,000. We accepted that. And that's why we're here today to receive our money for our property. Well, you mentioned that if it happened, it wouldn't happen in the 60s because people were sort of revolutionary in the 60s. And down here, you're right, there are people down here were law-abiding people down here. They were all, and they all got, it, it was like, it was like Germany in a way, you know what I mean? The, the authority came in and said, you're gonna do this, and, and basically the people had to do it because they were all law-abiding people. 
Uh, and all they wanted was their homes. But they, of course, their homes were taken away from them, so they had not, nothing less. I know, for example, I was staying here one day as a kid, and, the, and, and one of the representatives came in and, and was having an argument with my parents because my parents didn't want to move. Uh, and, uh, and the guy actually came out and said, you, you know, you, you people live like pigs down here. He said, you, you're like animals, and we want get, to get rid of you, which is, you know, <laughs> sort of far for people to take. Uh, some of the homes down here, by the way, now are, are still, uh, if, if there's only a few homes left, but you can go photograph those homes, and you'll find out that those homes today, 28 years down the road or 25 years down the road, are, are, are better than some of the homes that they're putting up some of the row homes that they're putting up now. I mean, the row homes may look nicer and so forth and so on as far as the uh, brick goes and, and they're newer, but the, uh, the homes down here, are, as I say, are, are nice homes that people have been living in for a long period of time. When people come back to this area now, they are lost. They don't know where streets are. They ask if the streets are still around. Some are and some aren't, and right now, I think we have about, let's see, about four, about four or five blocks that are original. The rest are all supposed to be progress, but it's not. I raised my six children out here, and my husband was born in this house, and seven of his brothers and sisters were born here. And my husband's brother lived in the next house, and he still lives there. And my sister-in-law, uh, now deceased, lived in the third house. So we were very happy out here. I was very frightened and full of fear when I heard that the area was going to be redeveloped. And I can't believe how relieved I was when I heard that some houses were going to be excluded from condemnation, and mine was one of them. Uh, some houses were excluded, excluded from condemnation because uh, they were high enough to tie into the sewer and in good condition. Well, there were 3,000 homes torn down. So you know there were at least 3,000 3, problems. Everybody had problems of one kind or another. Some people got sick. People had n nervous problems. Uh, it, you could ask any of the doctors that lived out here at the time that they had more patients coming in there for nervous disorders during the redevelopment than they had in their whole lifetime. And the druggist at 79th and Eastwick said he sold more aspirin after the area was condemned than he had since he started in business there. Oh gosh, they talked about it for 20 or 30 years before they ever got going on it. Did you believe them? Uh, I don't know. We didn't put too much stock in it, I don't think, when we first started talking. And then as the years went by, we just sort of pushed it aside, and then one day we woke up and found out that's what they were going to do. Yeah. And they did it. Well, they gave us no reason. They just sent some forms out in the mail saying that we were not involved in their pl present plans. And, of course, that's been almost 25 years, so I assume we will not be involved in them. And, and by that time, we'll all be ready to go someplace, I guess. Well, I think everyone out here was upset because no one wanted to leave. When our parents came out here and made this their home, this is where they expected to spend their retirement and the rest of their life. But unfortunately for some, it came at a time when they were just about ready to retire. And many of them died from the shock of having to pull up and go someplace else. And most of them had been out here 50, 60 years, and uh, it was a very difficult time for them. Of course, we were very happy when we found out that we were not going to be involved in it, but we still felt sympathy and empathy for the people that did have to leave. How about the houses? Did have houses were they as nice as yours? It's a beautiful house. Well, this hasn't always looked this way. I think everyone has sort of improved their properties over the year. Most of them are here to stay, and uh, you sort of do what you have to do to keep it going. No, we never thought about buying, I never thought about buying a home over on the other side. Maybe one of the reasons I probably couldn't have afforded it at that time. Because I imagine the money that people got for the homes out here, I have no idea. You hear so many different prices that uh, they still needed some additional money to go someplace else and buy another home. But many of the homes out here were beautiful that the people had to get out. It's just unreal that they would take such lovely homes. And of course, they do it by um, 
condemning them and there was absolute they didn't that was just their way of getting them because there was certainly nothing wrong with the homes they were some of them were beautiful absolutely beautiful hi my name is Ray Wright man of the house I find this area living out here very comfortable and extremely uh, uh, tranquil uh, the only setback is the environmental impact that it has uh, from previous uh, dumping has taken place one thing I noticed about out here is the airport and is very nearby and when the airplanes come in for a landing they come down too close to the house and sometimes the house vibrates and if it come down too low it feels like it's an earthquake and it trembles and sometimes things fall I moved on 83rd Street four years ago it's a quiet and peaceful neighborhood I enjoy the people I live around, they don't bother you, you don't bother them. And this is my daughter, Tedra. Yes, I like it around here too. We have a lot of play area and we have a convenient mall five blocks down the street. And we shop there. They have a supermarket. I mean, it's a lot of places. You don't have to go far, but if you work you know, out of the area, then you need a car around here, that's for sure. You can't just walk everywhere, just to the plaza mainly. You like it around here? It's pretty nice. It's not the best, but... What, what don't you like about it? A lot of burglaries, people breaking in other people's houses couple of rapes around here. They you know any of the old people that always been here before you? No. I was real excited about moving out into my first home. When I moved in, I hung drapes up at the living room window, and I came home from work, and they were sitting in the floor. And I looked up, and I saw the plaster hanging from the wall where I felt as though the wall wasn't strong enough to hold these drapes. And I said, boy, the house must have really been cheaply built. And I was quite upset that the walls couldn't hold up drapes. So I noticed upstairs that around the ceiling of the windows, the, uh, it was like poorly put together and it was cracks and holes. And when the winter came in, I like to froze in this house. There's no installation in the walls. You could feel the wind coming through the walls, not only the windows. And they tell you that they put these special windows in that's storm-proof and well-insulated, but it's not true. And up in the attic, they lay down installation to keep, I guess that's one of the regulations, but from the A-frame of the roof, all this cold air just blows right in. So it's up to you if you want to stay warm out here to insulate your own house. Everyone here is friendly. Uh, the neighbors get along together. At the time that I purchased this home, uh, thank God that they saw fit to have persons who purchased the new homes out here to sign that they would sell the homes to anyone, regardless to race, creed, or color. We have no trouble with our neighbors here. They are friendly, white and black, are living next door to each other. Uh, often my neighbors come by and I give them vegetables from my garden, and we have a PAC cooperation out here who work toward the improvements of the neighborhood. I was in the front planting flowers and I was digging holes in the yard to plant um, a bush and some trees out and I found cans and tires, rocks, a lot of like garbage. I guess they used it for landfill and I broke out in a rash and I came in the house and I called a doctor and I went to a skin specialist and he said it was a rare disease and they didn't know too much about it and what caused it. And there was any, no cure for it or no medication. I would just have to wait over a period of time for it to go away. And it took about a year for it to disappear. And I really think it had something to do with me digging outside in the dirt. 
but I never to this day found out why. What about the chemicals you were talking about in the ground? Some my chemicals. Well, we have a, a neighborhood suit going for, we have a chemical dump that's around the corner. Now they'll tell you today that the reason why it's not developed down here is because the economy changed. But there's still people who want decent housing. There's still people. Uh, Corman, wh where's Corman today? What's he building today? He has all of this land under his, his, his or a lot of it under his financial directions because, uh, because he was the major developer. And why isn't he building houses today? One reason is that they, they said that we're going to rebuild your neighborhood because it's, it's, it's below grade, it's a swampy area, and we've got to do something about it. So they blew in river silt, which is not the best thing to blow in. And I watched them put piles in the ground where they would drive one pile into the ground and it would go down so deep that they would have to drive another pile right on top of that one before they hit bedrock down there somewhere. Today, and I've heard this before, I mean, all, all during the course of it, you always heard people who were trying to get redressed because their houses were either filling up with swamp gas or they were filling up with, or they were cracking, the foundations were cracking because the ground is settling today. Uh, and, and the pilings isn't, aren't doing the job of holding the houses up, basically. But I watched them put in fields and fields and fields of pilings to put these hose, houses on, on ground that people had built houses on before they filled it in, you know, back in before the turn of the century. So they come in and they, and they do this for what purpose? Uh, th there doesn't seem to be any logical purpose today because of the vast acreage that we have that is undeveloped today. No matter what they say, you know, there was bad planning somewhere along the line. Um, as I say, the thing that really upsets me most, I, I think, is that the people were really abused down here. The kitchen floor is made of cement, so when you walk on the floor, it's so cold that in the wintertime, if you don't have your heat on, it will crack, your floor will crack right in half, which has happened, and plants have grown up through the floor from the cracking. <laughs> But that's something we have to deal with out here. You serious? It's a jungle house. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. the guy next door, he moved out, so there was no heat in his house. So all the pipes bust and water just oozed out all over the, all over the place. And from the floor being cement, it cracked. And the roots were like growing up out of the floor in his kitchen. And it was really weird. And, like and, and in here... Like, you have the option to have a bathroom downstairs. If not, if you don't want to pay for that, then they'll just have, like, an empty room. But they have the facilities there if ever in the future you want the bathroom. So there's this big round pipe in the middle of the floor, and these big giant sewerettes come up through the pipes, and they be running all around in your house. <laughs> it's horrible. Yeah. And the guy next door, one got in his house, and he chopped up the couch. They had to put the couch out in the trash because one got in the living room and they were in there trying to kill it with a hatchet. And that's from the way Corman laid the pipes in and never covered them or anything. Yeah, because, you know, I looked in the house and I saw these trees. It looked like little branches of trees growing up out of the floor. I said, look at this. And it was little leaves growing out and it looked like it was grass on the floor. It looked like a backyard. In Inside his living room. This is what I should be filming. See, it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Wow. Oh, really that's, that. yeah, that's dramatic, you know? Yeah. That's sad, too. That really happened for real? Yep. I am standing on the first lot of the beginning of the new home. As a matter of fact, my home was the first home that was built for the samples that were five homes built for samples. And it was under the side of Alla Avenue. I'm planning on moving within the next few years because I'm really looking for a nice stone house with a garage, um, a basement, and uh, maybe three stories high and fireplace. Something I know that's built well and it'll stand there and I don't have to worry about certain things messing up so soon. I enjoy it here in Eastwick because it reminds me of Oklahoma where I grew up. 
you have the suburbs and yet you're in the city. You're five minutes from downtown and the improvements that they have made out here is just beautiful. My mother and father went through a lot of physical and mental problems because of the pressure that the redevelopment put them under for a period of 20, 22 years. Uh, this house that we're living in now, that I'm living in, was my father's house. It was my grandfather's house. The redevelopment took the title to this property in 1958. They took the title to the property in 58. We did not get the title back until 1983. The thing that killed me the most was finally we get the property back. Now this is 22 years later, right? They give us, they took this property and held the title for 22 years, held the deed. We could not rent the property out. We could not sell the property. We couldn't make any improvements unless we wanted to lose the improvements. And every year or so, they would come and badger my parents to get out. Finally, after 22 years, we get the property back. And the next month, I get a tax bill for 22 years of back taxes. Their justification was that, well, you lived in that property for 22 years. And I said, well, you know, so fine. We lived in a property for 20. What kind of living is that when you're held hostage in your own house? I mean, you know, they, we live in a basically a free, and they pointed up to me, basically, you know, you live in a free country, but you really don't own anything. In, in actuality, you rent everything. You rent it from the government. You rent your house, you rent your car, you rent everything from the government, basically, because if you don't come across with your taxes, with your whatever they tell you that, that you're going to have to come across with, you lose it. I mean, it goes right back to them. So basically, the redevelopment, they came in, and, and, and it's hard because you can't point fingers at one or two people because they changed, you know, like you would say, well, this guy said this back in 1960, and the guy you're talking to would say, well, he's, he, he left the program in 62, and there were four guys in the same situation and the same job as he uh, during that period. Um, and those guys would get on a, on the phone with me back in 19, as I say, 19, you know, 79, 1980, when I was really putting pressure on to get the house back. And they would say, well, you, you have a moral responsibility to sell us that house because you're, you live in the United States and, and we have the right by Congress. Or you have a moral responsibility to pay this, this back. That's what they said. We, you have a moral responsibility to pay the back taxes. A, a guy from the redevelopment told me that over the phone. I got so mad. If I had been there, I would have punched him. You know what I mean? So that, 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 that he actually had the, had the guts to say over the phone to me that you have a moral responsibility to pay taxes for a house that we took off of you in 1958. In the past couple of years, we have like 30% a year raising taxes down here since that time there with the equality, supposedly, you know, this equalization of the tax program. Um, and so, so our taxes are being raised all the time, the property taxes down here. So they say, well, we're putting a new street in for you. So they go out and they put a new street in. And in order to put the street in, they have to, we used to have uh, two 80-year-old trees out on the front lawn there that my, my father planted, you know, my grandfather planted. They come in and cut the trees down, take the lawn, and move the streets to our house so that that vacant field over there can have a certain depth. Because if they ever do plan to build houses in there, they want the street, the, the houses to have 100-foot deep yards. So they take away more of our land, basically, so that they can go over there and, and build a bigger field, basically, is what they've done. They build a bigger field. How much longer is the field going to remain vacant? I mean, it's going to remain vacant forever. Now, we, of course, if you look across the streets, there, there's like one refrigerator left that we haven't hauled out. But guys come down here, they see this completely breaking area, vacant area, and, of course, it becomes a dumping area. If I have to go out there sometimes and threaten people to pick up their their trash. I got to go out there actually and, and with a, a note and take their license plate down with their dumping and say I'm going to turn you into the cops. And of course, and that's, that's risky, you know. Yeah. You know, so I can't do anything else but do it because otherwise they're just going to dump the stuff and pull away and that's it. Uh, police protection down here. Uh, if you're lucky, sometimes the cops come right away if you need it. Uh, I know that 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 one night there was a girl screaming out in the field there and we got police protection very quickly. I mean, other times, by the way, they can't find it. If I call into the, the 911 number, they say, well, where are you at? I say, well, I'm at 8130 Old Lindbergh Boulevard. And they send the place over to Lindbergh Boulevard. They don't know where Old Lindbergh Boulevard is. Uh, my mail, for example, goes to Lindbergh Boulevard. The guy over 
at our address in, a, in, a, in on Lindbergh Boulevard has actually used my wife's charges, ran up bills on my wife's charges because the mail, if they get a new mailman who doesn't know my name, he delivers it over on Lindbergh Boulevard. Now, on the city maps, on one city map, that street is called Pontiac Street. So if you use that, it, nobody can find Pontiac Street because there's no Pontiac Street down the post office. They don't know where Pontiac Street is. If UPS is sending it, or one of the delivery companies, right, I have to send it to my parents' house so that I can get it because they can't find this area. Nobody can find this street. Nobody knows where it's at. Well, if I had my way, I would really spend the rest of my life here because that's the meaning this place still has for me because of the fact that with all the people that I have gone, my father, my mother, and all the different families that I knew, and these are really my, my real memories, you know, it's all part of me. One thing when you moved out of the house, they didn't take too long to knock it yeah, down. Yeah, tear it down. Because I remember that day we moved, I was 19. And I had to go along with the truck to West Philadelphia, and I never realized that I would never get back there again to it's look so at that cool. house because they must have tore down the next day after we moved out. You know, and, and that, that really hurt. To get rid of it. We are at 84th and Tenicum Avenue. It used to be a church over on this corner here, and the American store was on the opposite corner, and a beer garden on the other corner. Remember that? Lou's beer garden? You don't remember? Oh, yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. It's like hard for me to Yeah. Yes. You know, so you get something to give. This is the play. That's the playground That's the right playground. over here where the fence is still up. Uh, the train tracks was closer, but not. Okay. Um, Rich okay. Mayor Hall was here. And what is it, Lou's, um, Lou's, Lou's Bar? Bar yeah. And right down that street there, believe it or not, Patty the Bell used to live down there. And um, that right park over the there, place. yeah, right across from the playground. And I'm, all the guys used to play basketball in there all the time. You know, uh, if you wanted to find your boyfriend, that's where he was <laughs> over there at the basketball court. Because that's the, about the only one we had. We didn't have much recreation out yeah. here. The biggest thing we did on Sunday, you walk to the airport and you come back home. You watch the planes come in. That was it. Remember um, how you contacted me about the reunion? Yes. Well, I said how, you know, I, that was fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, I called. When I called you, when I called you, I, you was all for it. Yeah. But when I contacted the other five people, they were so discouraged. They said, "Well, where would you have it? I mean, how could you possibly do that?" But I was just determined because I, you know, as I got older, I started missing all the people that I knew out here in Elmwood. You know, and I had a longing to see them. You know, so. I uh, decided, I said, well, we'll have it over here or in the park, back over here. Yeah. Look and at then the, you know, the people respond from the flyers that we sent out, Rosie. Wasn't that a good feeling that day? I tell you, when we came oh. out, it was, it was amazing because we didn't know how many people were going to show up. And that day when people just started coming in and the cars started lining up along the park, and then at one point we were told you couldn't get in or out. You were kind of in here, so that was it. Yeah, you were stuck you in were here. Stuck. And, yeah. and even the firemen came out because they were excited about it. They usually have nothing to do. So. Yeah. Well, you know that day, the first day, what really filled me up. Um, you know, I, you remember I had them play that record, say, Family Reunion. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that and was so everyone. beautiful. And, it was and a family I, affair. Yeah. yeah. And one, yeah. one incident I saw this here. Man, uh, he must have grew up with him. I hadn't seen him for years. This guy was like six feet, and the guy, other guy was about 5'3", and he ran up to him and grabbed him around the neck, and he wouldn't let the man go. He just hauled <laughs> on to him, and he cried because he was so happy to see him, you know. And just seeing that, I was so filled up that this day was a success, you know, and the people just demanded that. They wanted it every year afterwards, you It know? was definitely a success. It, it was, was. People just walked in the park that day with, After that was such a success, we wanted to do it again the following year. Remember what they told us? Yeah. They said that they're going to they, build... meaning the city of Philadelphia. <laughs> they said they're going to build a highway through the park and we couldn't use it. 
And so we didn't know what we were going to do. So then I asked you, what would you tie I said, well, maybe we can get to the playground over here on 84th and Line. And yes, then you wrote a letter to, uh, was it, was Wilson Good the managing director, right? He was right? managing director. Yeah, yeah. He, he was really uh, a help to us, He was very he? helpful yes, to us. Yes, he was. We started in 1981 having a reunion over here on 84th and Lines Avenue. And uh, we are really, we were really blessed with the weather, except one year. Remember one year, it yeah. was so hot. Oh, and, uh, yeah, I remember. Yeah, it was this <laughs> right elderly couple out there, and I think the temperature must have been close to 100. 100 degrees. Like, in their 70s, they were sitting on a chair with an umbrella over their head. Uh -huh. But they just did anything to get out there. And we have lost a lot of people yeah, since we've been having yeah. reunion. Not, no, young, too. Oh, a lot yeah. of young people yeah. have passed. And, and it's a lot of work, but isn't it worth yeah. it, Mr. Chapman? Uh, yeah. I mean, this is your first year with right, us, but right. I mean, don't you feel good about it? Yeah, because it seemed like everybody enjoyed itself, you know, just to see each other for the year. You know, where they move and they talk about old times and what used to be here and there and just reminisce. And then they go sing and yeah. some of them are just singing together and they, I mean, they just, they just have a good time that, on that particular day and they look forward to it. They, they start asking the first year, are you having a reunion yeah. again? And we have it every third Saturday in August. And you'd be surprised how far the distance the people come. You know, people yeah. are so sentimental about Ellenwood. You know, I have a brother who lived down in Virginia. He he has a long drive that goes into his um, house, to his yard, and he's going to name it Ellenwood. And I was really, I said, you bring it Ellenwood to Virginia. You know, but I mean, people are just that sentimental about um, yeah. Ellenwood. Hello, a scene of how Ellenwood was. <laughs> Hello, I'm glad to meet everybody from El uh, from Ellenwood. I've, I've been here at every reunion that they have had. And this is God's country. You never find another country like this is down here. I lived down here 77 years. Hello, everybody. I'm the wife of the late Reverend Earl O. Simpkins. And uh, uh, I belong to Enon Baptist Church, 54th and Samson, Reverend Roy Madrid is my pastor. And I've been here over 50 years. And I enjoyed every bit of it. And uh, I thank God that we back here again. My name is Mordell Purifoy. I came to Philadelphia in 1922. My mom and daddy brought me here from the South. I went to Ellis Carey School for the first grade. In 1926, they built Wolf School, and I got a transfer from there to Wolf School. I graduated from Wolf School. I grew up at 8424 Suffolk Avenue. I married in 1939. I buried my 13 children out here in Ellenwood. I raised them here. I think Ellenwood is a great place to be. I see so many faces and they so familiar faces. It's always great for us to meet once a year. I'm looking forward to it next year. My talk to is about my dad, my sisters, my brothers, and my mother, which is here with me. My mother is here with me. And it was 12 of us, and we grew up up in Elmwood and went to school from here. My children, my father was a committeeman down here for quite a few years and was very well known, Charlie Purifoy. What value to history does this piece of land called Eastwick hold? When the Swedish first came to this country in the 1700s, Eastwick was one of the first places the settlers built homes and farmed. In 1777, just below the junction of the Delaware River and the Schuylkill River, on the very land that is now known as Eastwick, is where one of the most courageous battles in the American Revolution took place at Fort Mifflin. General George Washington sent this message to the garrison of about 400 men holding the fort. The post with which you are now entrusted is of the utmost importance to America and demands every exertion of which you are capable for its security and defense. Andrew M. Eastwick, for whom the section Eastwick was named, lived from 1810 to 1879. He was a pioneer locomotive builder, world traveler, and landowner. He associated with the flags of the great botanist John Bartram. Of all his feats and known compassion, the construction of Eastwick's great mansion is most important to this story. It was a huge building, a glorious mansion for its time. 
Its magnificent tower reached 100 feet with a tank on top, able to hold many gallons of water. From the tower, one could see the surrounding city, including the winding Schuylkill River and entire meadows. It stood at this very spot, within yards of the still existing John Bartram House. The Eastwick Mansion burned down in 1896. At the turn of the century, Philadelphia was booming in prosperity and one of the finest cities in the world, despite having a reputation of also being one of the most corrupt cities in the world. Developers in Eastwick were busy splitting the land into 10,000 lots and running excursion trains from Center City for potential buyers. Free beer and ice cream were used for encouragement. 25-foot lots were sold for $50 each with a $2.50 down payment. Way on the outskirts of town, fits this site of Tinicum Avenue during the early part of the century. The Bell Road station once stood at Bell Road and Island Road. Eastwick's famous Suffolk racetrack was located at 81st Street and Island Road. This strange piece of land with its controversial past that reaches back for centuries has always been a place of various names. Names that the people loved, cherished, and refused to compromise in the midst of change. Employment was a major cause for many inhabitants who moved to Elmwood in the early part of the century. This was during the Industrial Revolution, before it all came to a halt. Eastwick was ideal, especially for those who worked at the nearby massive Hog Island shipyard during the First World War. General Electric was also within walking distance. Fells the Soap Company at Woodland Avenue and Island Road was even closer. The huge Baldwin Locomotive Company was first at 16th and Spring Garden Street, then moved to Chester Pike in Eddy Stone, Delaware County. Baldwin was very popular for Eastwick employment. There were also the Sun Shipyard, Ford Motors in Chester, Pennsylvania, Scott Paper and others. The Western House plant in Leicester, Pennsylvania was also where many of the Elmwood community worked, especially my relatives. Like most places, many black families in Elmwood originally migrated from the South, with a pioneer leading the way. My family was no exception. The pioneer in our family was Cleveland Gillette, known commonly as the Kid, Kid Cleve, they call him. How'd you get on that? Uh, my brother they got me on there. They got me on in 1941. They got me on there because at that time I was working in a garage when making about $15 a week. And they said, well, soon as started to hire we'll get you on a Western house. And so they did. So they brought me an application. I filled it out, went down there. And about, at that time, about a thousand men was at the gate trying to get in. Try to, uh, try to get in West House, and the man had my name, and he called, come out there and looked all over all those guys, and called my name. And the guy said, that little old man, they called him, and didn't call us? So how is that? Wonder why he called that little old man? During Christmas time, I used to build a stage my brother, and I used to do a little dance for him, called him Black Bottom, yes, you got him. He said, Black Bottom, yes, you got him. 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 The other day, you call a box shop. Place now, they, they call it copper stone. We got a pretty house back here. Every time it rained, I was have a storm out there, you'd be a flood back there. And uh, it, they had to go back there and, 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 and scare from boats and get the people out. They couldn't get out. In 1933, the East Coast experienced a terrible storm. Because of its low level, Eastwick's condition was disastrous. The damage was so severe that President Franklin Delano Roosevelt granted the services of the Pennsylvania Contingents of the Emergency Conservation Corps to rebuild the dikes which caused floods in Eastwick and in Tinicum Township, Delaware County. It seems that Eastwick has always been a problem to Philadelphia. In 1725, the first official act was made towards Eastwick. The Pennsylvania Assembly authorized the owners to build dikes to hold back the tidewater. This act led to many problems as to whose responsibility it really was to maintain the dikes. In 1762, several companies were authorized to keep up the dikes and build the property owners. In the years that followed, millions of dollars were spent. Not far from that graveyard of and lost memories is another graveyard that is more recognizable for what it is. Many of the people from the old neighborhood are buried up at Mount Lawn Cemetery. Bessie Smith, the world's greatest blues singer, is also buried up on Mount Lawn. 
So is Uncle Cleve. It is hoped that the memory of our old community will last as long as the beautiful sound of Bessie Smith's great voice. In 1950, Larry Darnell's record, entitled I'll Get Along Somehow, captured the essence of the times for the black community. It wrapped this melody around my existence and painted my life with meaning. But little did we know then that our beloved community was doomed. And just 10 months later, our world, as we knew it then, would soon be gone forever. Fine things you said and how just a little success. Yes, just a little taste of success has gone straight to your pretty little head. Over read a burden, oh, what a pretty name. Fit for a movie star. And my main man, Lewis Williams. He's gone, but not forgotten. The first one began, Larry, darling, sweetheart, my wonderful The life of Doris Smith came to an untimely end on the busy highway called Hook Road, shortly after this picture was taken. Such a waste, such a shame. Yes, it came from your pen, dear, but not from your heart. The third. The Earl Theater, located in Center City, 11th and Market Street, was maybe the most important movie theater to us at that time. More precious than our own Crescent Theater at 84th and Washington Avenue at the railroad tracks. The Earl's claim to glory was the world's greatest love singer, Sonny Till, and his Orioles. To me, no other crooner captured the love of those sentimental times like Sonny Till. No one else came close. This is Alice Carey Elementary School. This is Thomas Reed. It still stands in the midst of the old and new Eastwick. This is John Bartram High, located at 67th and Elmwood Avenue, where many from Eastwick attended, including myself. There was also McKean School. I remember the orange fields in the fall, the cherry trees filled and bent from cherry burden. I remember all those big family names that everybody knew and multitudes of colorful nicknames. I recall the gambling, the hunky-tonk pity pat games, and busy music, and bluesy people overflowing with style and personality. I remember all the beautiful different colors of black children who ran and leaped all over our world. I sometimes visit some of the old people who once had land to stretch out and walk around, to plant gardens and raise flowers. I've seen them after the big theft, all crowded, pushed and packed into small apartments across town. I remember how bright the sun seemed to shine in those old golden days gone forever. For some reason, I can't recall winter, although I know we had blizzards. And I can still visualize the way in which the naked trees sprouted above housetops and the textured field sticks stood brown and bare. But my memory is all summer, spring, and fall. I remember how fresh the air felt, how loud the people laughed when they were happy, and how sad and how much they cried when disaster struck. I recall how rapid deaf news spread throughout our community. I remember the way birds flapped across the sky and sang to us from tall and short trees and bushes. I remember the flies, bees, ants, and worms. I can still hear the yapping puppies and barking dogs, the roaring airplanes that constantly passed over our heads. In ratio to its population, Eastwick had more churches than most other sections of Philadelphia. In its two square miles, there were 20 churches. Fortunately, most of the destroyed churches were relocated in nearby West Philadelphia. Beulah Baptist Church is now located at the corner of 50th Street and Spruce Street. Formerly, it was at 83rd Street and Tenecum Avenue. Elmwood Community Church is at 46th Street and Chester Avenue. Formerly, it was at 86th Street and Laycock Avenue. Calvary Baptist Church is at 61st Street and Gerard Avenue. Formerly, it was at 86th Street and Berwick Avenue. New Hope Baptist Church is at 5950 Irving Street. Formerly, it was at Suffolk Avenue, east of 84th Street. People's Baptist Church is at 51st Street and Baltimore Avenue. Formerly, it was at Eastwick Avenue, west of 82nd Street. Emanuel AME Church is at the corner of Chestnut Street and Redfield Street. It was at Bartram Avenue, west of 78th Street. St. Peter's Community Church is at 6027 Chestnut Street. Formerly, it was at 84th Street and Crothers Avenue. St. Scythian Episcopal Church merged with St. Barnabas Episcopal Church. It's located at 6400 Halford Avenue, formerly at 85th Street and Lindbergh Boulevard. Mount Olive Baptist Church is at 5501 Locust Street. Formerly, it was at Holstein Avenue, west of 84th Street. Not all of the older churches have been relocated from Eastwick. In the Clearview section, Clearview Methodist Church still stands. 
There is much change in this neighborhood of old and new structures, but there is a resemblance of what it once was. Unlike the Clearview Church, the remains and ghosts of what was once St. Raphael's Roman Catholic Church and his neighbor around the corner, St. Paul, live in the center of the hurricane. In the midst of decay and desolation, there is no resemblance of what it was. Only time will tell the eventual fate. Perhaps St. Paul AME Church, located at what is left of 86 and Bartram Avenue, is the true gallant survivor of all, with its rich history and congregation still very much intact. The dedication and love is as strong as ever, never withering, never giving in. But the sound of the mad bulldozer can still be heard in the distance, echoing between the lovely hymns. This is not just a field of weeds. Thirty years ago, a proud and unique community stood here and beyond. There were houses with picket fences, gardens, young and old people, and the laughter of children. Anymore. Anymore.